Welcome to the first video in a new series I'll be doing called The Lore of Westeros. The first topic will be Westeros' climate, but expect future videos on their culture, biology, astronomy, and all sorts of topics. My goal is to explain how the average Westerosi citizen understands and interacts with their world. I'm starting with likely the most difficult facet of Westeros to explain. The climate in this fantasy world has traces of real-world science, but ultimately the nature of Westeros might not even be nature, but magic instead. In this video, I'll cover the climates of each kingdom, I'll try to explain Westerosi seasons, and I'll explain George R. R. Martin's larger theme surrounding climate change. The climates and weather patterns of Westeros are fairly reminiscent of Earth, stretching from the icy tundra wasteland beyond the wall to the dry arid sands of Dorne. The northernmost region of the known world are the lands beyond the wall. The land of always winter is an arctic, barren, icy wasteland, and the land grows more hospitable as you move down south towards the wall, but it's all cold. For comparison, the wall correlates roughly to Earth's latitude of 61 degrees 97 minutes, or in the middle of Norway. The Fist of the First Men correlates roughly to 3 degrees above that in the middle of our Iceland, which makes sense since a lot of Beyond the Wall scenes in Game of Thrones were filmed on location in Iceland. It's unsure if there is a land past that of Always Winter, but my best guess is that it stretches on to the North Pole. Most free folk live around the Haunted Forest, just north of the Wall, or the Frostfangs, northwest of the Wall. Smaller groups of free folk reside all the way up in Thin, or along the frozen shore in the west and the Shivering Sea in the east. However, no one lives in the only noted free folk town of Hardhome anymore, thanks to a mysterious disaster 600 years ago that we don't have an answer for yet. According to legend, the ashes from the Hardhome disaster rained down on the Haunted Forest and Shivering Sea for half a year. Winterfell is the capital of the Kingdom of the North. Sitting at roughly 54 degrees latitude, the land of the North is comparable to southern Canada, and George R. R. Martin has stated that Scotland was his inspiration for it. The Kingdom, making up about a third of the continent, is sparsely populated and features long stretches of wilderness, coniferous trees, snowy mountains, and a plethora of villages and ancient holdfasts. The climate is harsh and bitter cold during the winters, but more temperate with rare snows in the summer. Northerners have a particularly special bond with winter, as House Stark's words are winter is coming. It's not a battle cry, but a warning to watch yourself and prepare. If the harvests leading up to long winters are not plentiful, then the unforgiving climate of the north will lead to famine and mass casualty, in addition to the deaths caused by exposure to the environment, which is an even worse threat to rangers of the Night's Watch. Some greater northern lords keep greenhouses or glass gardens on their lands, such as the glass gardens of Winterfell. This helps sustain them if the harvest yield, typically one-fifth to one-fourth of the grain harvest, is not sufficient, in addition to the frozen, salted stores of meat. Northerners living on the coasts also have access to fishing. The northerners have learned how to survive their climate, but it remains among the harshest in the realm. The north and the riverlands are connected by the Neck, a swampy, marshy region of Cranachmen held by House Reed. The Riverlands, though consistently abused amidst warfare throughout history, have a very hospitable, temperate climate. Their latitude is roughly similar to Earth's 39 degrees 75 minutes, placing it between Madrid and Washington, D.C. The climate is very temperate with warm summers and moderately cold winters, but not harsh on either side. Their most impactful piece of nature is the Trident, a great wide river with three branches, useful for quick transportation of goods and men, as well as a reliable supply of fish. The Crown Lands most notably are home to King's Landing, the capital of the Seven Kingdoms, as well as two islands, Dragonstone and Driftmark. This region sits at roughly 34 degrees 5 minutes latitude, or between San Francisco and Cairo. The Crown Lands are bordered by the Blackwater Bay to the east, an inlet to the narrow sea that helps cool King's Landing in hot summers, with wind sweeping over the water. Dragonstone is a volcanic island, smelling of sulfur and brimstone, and experiences strong winds and storms, especially in autumn. Driftmark is a fertile, temperate island, occasionally experiencing strong waves, hence the castle named High Tide. The Vale of Arryn is a beautiful region of mountains, valleys, lakes, and rivers, and is isolated and protected from the rest of Westeros thanks to the Mountains of the Moon. Its approximate latitude is 40 degrees, similar to Earth's Madrid or Venice. The land is extremely fertile in the Vale thanks to its abundance of water bodies and lack of wars, which ravage the riverlands. Temperatures are very cool and temperate here, but it will get cold and snowy atop the Vale at the Erie, as with any mountain range. The west is a land full of rolling plains, broadleaf forests, and rugged hills, many of which hide extensive caverns. 
This region borders the Sunset Sea to the west, offering coastline breeze, and the War Torn Riverlands to the east. The western and Pendrick Hills systems not only guard Cashley Rock and Lattisport from other kingdoms, but the hills also contain deep caches of gold, which the Lords of the Rock have mined for many years, allowing them to be among the richest houses in Westeros. The majority of the land in the west is flat land, with warm temperatures and fertile soil. Off the west coast of the Westerlands are the Iron Islands, an archipelago comprised of seven main islands called Pike, Old Wick, Great Wick, Harlaw, Saltcliff, Black Tide, and Orkmont. But don't forget the tiny island Lonely Light, which is actually 13 miniature islands, the westernmost point in the known world. The Iron Islands have roughly just above a 40 degree latitude, as Pike is essentially a straight shot west from the Vale of Arran. The total number of islands is 31, and they are constantly ravaged by the storms of the Sunset Sea. They have harsh, stormy summers and chilly winters. The islands consist of sharp, rocky land structures with infertile, stony soil. It's no wonder why the Ironborn prefer to spend their time at sea rather than at home. The geology of the Iron Islands allows for an abundance of iron ores with high iron oxidizing soil. The Stormlands are bordered by three other kingdoms, as well as Shipbreaker Bay to the east. As you can guess by the ominous name of its water, the Stormlands are often targeted by storms coming off the narrow sea. While the northern Stormlands peninsulas have a warm, wet climate, the Dornish Marches to the southwest have a cold alpine climate despite being so close to the deserts of central Dorn. The approximate latitude of the Stormlands is around 30 degrees, relating to northern Florida or Cairo. Lastly, while the waters are stormy near the coast, the Isle of Tarth is said to have clear, sapphire blue water, giving the region some character. The Reach is the second largest kingdom behind the north. Its soil is the most fertile in all of Westeros. It's the most habitable region not only in Westeros, but likely in all the world, thanks to its fertile land, its large river the Mander, and its warm, temperate climate. The Arbor, an island off its southwest coast, is famous for its warm vineyards, supplying much of the world with wine. The flowery capital of Highgarden is roughly 28 degrees latitude, a little north of Marine or northern Mexico. Last but not least is Dorne, the southernmost region of Westeros. Dorne is also the hottest region, with dry, punishing deserts at the center. The rocky red mountains in the north, bordering the stormlands, and dry, stony land in the east. The south is home to 400 leagues of sharp cliffs, bluffs, and whirlpools. The soil is very poor for agriculture anywhere besides places surrounding the region's rivers. Those places, like Sunspear, Lemonwood, and the Planky Town, are all very hospitable and house most of the population of the kingdom. The farther you stray from the rivers and port towns, however, the more deadly the land becomes. Doran's latitude is roughly 23 degrees, in between Astapor and Marine, or similar to Earth's northern Africa. Despite the regional differences in climate, the kingdoms of Westeros all experience the same seasons, as the entire continent is in the northern hemisphere, as confirmed by George R. R. Martin. The seasons of Westeros are one of the most notable fantasy elements of the world, as they are unpredictably long or short, harsh or tame. Trying to attach real-world science to a work of fiction is a fool's game, but I am a fool, and will attempt to do so. In real life, seasons are caused by Earth's axis being tilted as it spins around our star once every 365 Earth days. Our axial tilt is about 23.5 degrees, and as we circle the sun, one half of the planet will be closer to the sun at some points than the other half. This is why the northern and southern hemispheres experience opposite seasons, as one receives more sunlight while the other receives less. Earth seasons are predictable though. Where I live, in northern America, we start to get winter in early to mid-December and summer in May, every year. In Westeros, once summer comes, it may last two years or ten years, and it's up to the maesters to study temperature and weather patterns to tell the rest of the continent when to expect the coming of a new season. Why is this? Well, given the lack of scientific advancement in the world, the common folk tell each other tall tales, such as that every long summer is followed by an even longer and harsher winter. That's kind of the whole Stark motto. We know that extreme seasons, not necessarily long or short seasons, are caused by strong axial tilt. Earth seasons are habitable mostly anywhere in the world thanks to our tame 23.5 degree tilt. But Uranus, for example, is a sideways planet with an axial tilt of 98 degrees. So the citizens of Uranus experience 21 year long summers where night never comes, constant daylight. Conversely, they experience 21 Earth year-long winters, where day never comes, a very long night indeed. We can thank Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler for our modern understanding of how axial tilt affects a planet's severity and length of seasons. However, Westeros cannot have a strong axial tilt with inhospitably harsh seasons. That would mean that the long summer, the era in which John and Danny and Rob were born, 
would have been a years-long season of scalding hot temperatures. Crops would not be able to grow, wildlife would die out, etc. There are no reports of a mass extinction event during the long summer, so we know the seasons are at least hospitable, and the axial tilt is relatively tame, like Earth's. Another theory some readers have is that the planet's tilt is not extreme, but rather wobbly and irregular, shifting back and forth over the years. Earth does have this to a very small degree, called the Chandler Wobble, but if a planet had extreme wobble, that would cause it to have rapid and erratic changes in its seasons. NASA's Kepler spacecraft found such a planet, called Kepler 413b, with a spinning axis that can vary by 30 degrees over the course of years. However, we can pretty reliably say that this wobbly axis phenomena does not apply to the planet of A Song of Ice and Fire. And there's textual evidence, too. In Davos 6, A Storm of Swords, he is stargazing on Dragonstone, and notices the bright blue eye that always marked due north. Davos was a smuggler, and smugglers know all the constellations and stars to help guide them on the water. If there's a star that's always reliably due north, then the axis cannot be shifting around. It must behave similar to Earth, which has its own north star that looks like a blue eye, called Vega. So if Planetosa's axial tilt is not extreme, and it is not wobbly and shifting, why are the seasons so irregular? The honest answer is that it's magic, and George R. R. Martin has said as much. So maybe instead of trying to apply science, we should take a look at some of the mythology and folklore of A Song of Ice and Fire. Most of the ancient myths of this world are tied to seasons, and a dramatic disruption of normal seasons, with a death and rebirth of the sun. The Azor High prophecy, for example, which is told all across the world in different variations, is about a hero being born after a long summer, who will cast down the others in defense of the living. George R. R. Martin has gone out of his way to set this up in the story. The long summer is when Azor High figures, like Jon Snow and Daenerys Targaryen, were born and a red comet appears in the sky during Book 2, which is taken for a bleeding star to signal the coming of the prince that was promised. Additionally, some readers believe that Planetos once had two moons, one of which crashed down to the surface in an impact event thousands of years ago. This would explain some of the ancient myths, like the Carthene one that Doria tells Sedani, about a moon cracking and dragons pouring out of it. A trader from Carth told me that dragons come from the moon. The moon? He told me the moon was an egg, Khaleesi. That once there were two moons in the sky, but one wandered too close to the sun and it cracked from the heat. Out of it poured a thousand thousand dragons, and they drank the sun's fire. It is possible that an impact event set off a chain of magical phenomena that caused the original long night 8,000 years ago, and the seasons may have been regular before that, but forever irregular after. Ultimately, there is no climate science explanation for the irregular seasons of Planetos, nor will we ever be given a science fiction explanation for it. This is a fantasy series, and the magic behind the irregular seasons will be fantastical, according to a 2007 quote by George R. R. Martin. He said, They develop lengthy theories. Perhaps it's a multiple star system, and what the axial tilt is. But I have to say, nice try guys, but you're thinking in the wrong direction. This is a fantasy series. I am going to explain it all eventually, but it's going to be a fantasy explanation. It's not going to be a science fiction explanation. So, straight from the source, every idea I put forward in this video has been debunked by God George himself, but definitely leave a comment if you have a theory for the fantasy explanation of the seasons. The last topic I want to cover is the overarching theme of climate change in A Song of Ice and Fire. Many fans, myself included, find similarities between the ways that southern citizens of Westeros especially players of the Game of Thrones, refuse to put any stock into the idea of a deadly weather-related threat in the North. And George R. R. Martin has agreed with this parallel in a New York Times interview, saying, The people in Westeros are fighting their individual battles over power and status and wealth, and those are so distracting them that they're ignoring the threat of winter is coming, which has the potential to destroy all of them and to destroy their world. Arrogant, self-absorbed or merely ignorant southerners ignore the grumpkins and snarks and possibility of a long winter in order to pursue their own goals. No one rides north to help in the fight against the others during season 8 of Game of Thrones, except those who are already there for political reasons, like the Knights of the Vale. In the books, the only one who rides north is Stannis, a king who cared. He believes his destiny is to be Azor High and to cast down the Long Knight as the champion of R'hllor. But even he isn't purely rid of self-interest. Stannis aims to win the Lords of the North to his cause, and take his throne in the South as well. George R. R. Martin went on to say, We're fighting over issues, important issues, mind you, foreign policy, domestic policy, civil rights, social responsibility, social justice. 
But while we're tearing ourselves apart over this and expending so much energy, there exists this threat of climate change, which, to my mind, is conclusively proved by most of the data and 99.9% .9 of the scientific community, and it really has the potential to destroy our world. The world of Westeros is certainly in danger of being destroyed, not by a man-made increase in global warming or pollution, but rather a magical fantasy symbol of that, and the man-made greed to ignore it. If you have any thoughts on the climate and natural science of Westeros, be sure to leave a comment down below, and subscribe for more A Song of Ice and Fire and House of the Dragon content. I'm also planning future videos in this series about Westeros' astronomy, culture, and much more. Thanks for watching.